It's all about you, God. It's all about you and your people. It's just serve proclaiming and declaring that it's all about him. It's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you.
Jesus' prayer that Ben Clark was um, praying before we started. Jesus' prayer, let heaven come on earth. And I think this also means the worship of heaven come to earth. The worship of heaven come to earth. A place in which Jesus is praised. He's loved. He's honored. He's welcomed. He is exalted. His songs are sang about him, sings of honor and praise. And we join the angels' song, singing hallelujah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Let heaven come to earth. Let the worship of heaven ignite this place in our hearts. joining us today. Angels are joining the church.
never get tired of singing that song. We'll be singing it forever. It's called the Song of the Lamb, and there's no one more worthy than Jesus for what he's done for us. Why don't you just raise your voice again and just say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for seeking me. Thank you for wanting me. Thank you for pursuing me. Thank you for not leaving me to myself. Thank you that you loved me first before I ever loved you. Thank you you've never given up. Thank you for pursuing me. Thank you for your faithfulness. We'll have more time to, to worship the Lord and to bow down and present ourselves before him after uh, Dr. Fred finishes his sermon. There'll be an afterglow, and I'd love for you to all be part of that. You may be seated. Thank you, guys. Appreciate that very much. There's a team that came down from Canada to look after our children. They wanted to be here for the conference, but they also looked after our children. They spent three hours with our kids this morning <laughs> trying to keep them uh, engaged. And <clears throat> it's, they had a wonderful, wonderful experience. Can you just give it up for the team from, from Quinty? <clears throat> Actually, they spent three hours with their kids today. Could we give it up for your kids? Uh, give it up for them. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> well, we're so glad you're here tonight. And um, we really don't have much in the way of announcements other than uh, uh, the meeting's not over when the speaker's down. That's, things are just going to begin. Uh, it's kind of hard when the band is doing the afterglow. We want them to be able to do that, be able to hear uh, when you're being prayed for. So we've cleared some space over here. We've cleared some space off to the side. And so when we invite you forward for any kind of ministry or you make your way to the front, we'll try to do an offside a little bit just so that uh, you can hear what people are praying for you. And uh, maybe that'll help. Um, there's a nursery for toddlers tonight. If you follow this gal going right down the hallway, three-year-old and under, they'll look after them uh, during the sermon part of it, and then you can go collect them after that. If you want to do that, that's great. Um, we are live streaming tonight. Can you give it up for people who are watching on live stream? Let them hear your voice. People down in Delaware listening in tonight and other places. Um, we've had some glitches with the live stream. We're not sure exactly what it is. We can't quite figure it out. So you on live stream, if something happens that there's a... Uh, uh, disconnection, just go to our, our YouTube channel and you'll be able to pick it up there and be able to finish watching it. So um, I'm going to invite Dr. Fred to come up and he's going to invite Ian to come up uh, when, however that suits you and uh, however you want to do that. So uh, how'd, you, how'd you like Dr. Fred preaching this morning? Wasn't that great? <clears throat> he's preaching with passion. You heard passion. You saw a guy preaching with passion. Did you like that? Yeah. President Lincoln uh, had to attend the Washington Cathedral. It was the, the Church of Presidents. He had to attend. But at night, he'd slip into the old Methodist church, and he'd get in a back pew just to hear some fiery, passionate preaching. He said, I like watching a man preach who's fighting, looks like he's fighting bees. So tonight, if you're fighting bees, we're with you. We, we want to be a part of that. So, God bless. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. For... I'll tell you what, it's either passion or ADHD. I'm not exactly sure which. Pastor, may I uh, impose on, uh, maybe get a couple strong guys to give me that table, if they could, please? Oh my gosh. I could just go with it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Right over here. I could just go with the worship. I don't know about you. That was some powerful worship. Powerful worship. Why don't you, uh, I want you to turn to somebody. And I want you to say, uh, just turn to somebody and say, I really don't know what that guy's going to say tonight, but I hope it's good. Could you do that, please? <laughs> I have no idea what he's going to say today, but 
this evening, but it's, I hope it's good. Uh, I'm going to get my beautiful wife here. Honey, I, I left my water over there. This is rather unorthodox, I realize, but thank you, honey. It's my wife, Debbie. She's a blessing. <laughs> She, uh, as I said this morning, she, uh, she led me to Jesus. She kept saying, you need Jesus. You need Jesus. Why, Debbie? Because you messed up. <laughs> you really messed up. You need Jesus. <laughs> oh, well, she was right in both occasions, you know. That's, that's okay. Hey, if the uh, Delaware people are there, I know most of you. Because we had a practice, we had about four offices on the eastern shore of Maryland and Delaware. So if you're listening, good to see you again. I'm not charging you tonight. That's pretty good. <laughs> it is a blessing. It's good being with you. Uh, Ian, by the way, Pastor, uh, is going to do that tomorrow morning, if that's okay with you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I'll, I'm going to have that. I don't know where he's at. Uh, but it is a blessing. You know, you got some, I tell you what, there's some, there's some guys here today. Now, I've seen some beards. But the man who plays that bass has got a good beard. There's no question about that. Please. He got a beard. Now, there's, there's some guys that, you know, they, they can grow beards. And, and then there's some guys that can grow beards. You got another guy who's out there, burly guy, a big guy. The kind of big, strong, the kind of guy you need to take offerings with. You know, these are the kind of guys you need to take offerings with. <clears throat> and uh, you got, he got, I said, brother, you got a good beard? He said, yeah, no, I got a pretty good beard. <laughs> I got a very good one. So uh, I just, I've never seen so many beards and so many good beards around here. So that's not that I've ever, not that I've ever, uh, my, my sons kept saying, dad, why don't you grow a beard? I said, I, I just can't get into it, you know. I just, just don't know what it is, but you got some great beard. I don't know what that means. But um, you get some good beards. All I can say is the people who have really healthy beards, and you've been blessed with that, you should tithe twice as much, okay? <laughs> a double portion. God gave you a double portion of hair, then put it in there, okay? That's all I'm saying. You know, I got a, a pastor, I got to show you this. Not only is that a good book, it really helps me with my iPad right here, too. <laughs> but I, I don't know. Can I have this book? <laughs> that is, how many of you got a blessed pastor and pastor wife here? They are fantastic. They are something else. I just met your pastor not even a year ago, I think, and, and you just fell in love with him. He's a great, great man, great spirit, great leader, uh, church planner. Uh, just a really nice guy and a Finney fan, and I can't wait for your book to come out, brother. As soon as that book comes out, I'd love to have an autographed copy for free, if that's all right. <laughs> Go a beard. <laughs> well, I want to talk with you tonight. I want to talk with you about something that's very special to me because I believe we're going to need this more and more in the day that we are facing. In case you haven't noticed, we are in a very challenging spot in our, these United States. We just are. I'm not going to get political. I could give jack squat about it. I'm not going to do it. I'm just simply saying there's like in the days of Isaiah and even the days of Elijah, I should say. Uh, there's a lot of bad stuff going on. But anytime there's bad stuff going on, it's always an opportunity for the power of God to come in. We can't expect things to get better because things are not going to get better. They're just not going to get better. Biblically, they don't get better. But the power of God and the person of Jesus and the extension of redemption in the lives of men and women and young men and women is endless. Amen. So uh, I asked today uh, how many are expecting for a fifth grade awakening I want to ask you again, how many, two questions, how many are expecting for a, a fifth grade awakening, huh? That's kind of weak, come on. How many are expecting for a fifth grade awakening? All right. How many now long to be used in that fifth grade awakening? All right. I'm going to challenge you tonight now. I'm going to challenge you tonight because I want to talk about relying on the Holy Spirit. Relying on the Holy Spirit of God. I want to go into a scripture, and then I'm going to go off and on on a couple things. But um, I'm convinced 
that the power of God in our lives is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond anything we could possibly ask or think. We all have challenges. As a former pastor of 23 years and as a licensed mental health professional, I can tell you that we all have problems. We all have, we're all messed up because of our human condition. One way or the other, some more so than others. But the fact is some things we can't even, it's not even our fault, it's genetically given to us. But that doesn't mean that we have to be limited and that doesn't mean we have to be defined by it. I'm only defined by one person and that is the person of Jesus Christ. And, he, and who he says I am, I am. I'll never forget um, when I got first saved in the, in the Jesus People movement. My wife remembers this. I was, in, I was from Baltimore originally. And, um, and there was a show there called uh, um, uh, uh, The Larry Angel Show. It was a daytime show like they have in a lot of towns. And after Larry Angel was there, actually Oprah Winfrey came in. Actually, Oprah Winfrey started in Baltimore. And she went from Baltimore, I think, then to Chicago. But the Larry Angel Show, make a long story short, it was 1972, and uh, every, every place was on fire for God. Young people were on fire. Everywhere was on fire for God. And so the Channel 13 heard about this. He said, we want to talk about your coffee house, The Escape. So we were on, uh, myself and a guy named Tom Nelson uh, was on this radio program. He was the more logical of the two. He worked for NSA and he was a great speaker and I had just gotten saved and I just came out of the drug culture and I was the guy that was just giving his testimony. And, um, and so I remember um, that he, they called us up, we were on the program and we were getting ready to go on this uh, television show. And they were in the back putting some makeup on us and my wife had asked some of the people where she worked with, she said, come on, my husband's gonna be on television, you know? Well, I want you to see him, we, we, we didn't even have any kids. Wow, we didn't have no kids. Didn't we have some fun when we didn't have any kids? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that, doesn't mean that, you, that doesn't mean that you don't have fun with your kids. <laughs> it means you can have a little fun sometimes before you have, have as much fun as you can and then have kids. You know why? Because the fun stops. No, I'm only kidding. That's not, not the case. It gets better. It gets different is what it gets. It just gets different. We didn't have any children. And she said, come on, I want you to see Freddie's going to be on Channel 13 in the Larry Angel Show. So, you know, the, we were on the seats and, and uh, the cameras were there. And, and, um, and so it was a countdown. And uh, then the cameras popped on. It was the cue song. They were doing his thing. And, and all of a sudden it was Larry Angel. He's talking and opened up the program. But before that, somebody came into the dressing room and said, oh, by the way, with you two, there is going to be another interview with another guy who has a descending opinion of what is really actually going on here with these Jesus freaks. That's what they called us. And I looked at Tom and I said, what's a descending opinion? I don't know what it was. He said, well, that's somebody who really doesn't agree with us. I said, Tom, do we got to debate them? He said, well, I don't know. I said, Tom, I can barely talk myself. How am I going to debate somebody? And um, then we're here we are, and the lights come on. Larry Angel, he first looks at me, and he turns, and he says, and the light comes on on the camera, turn red, pop. And I was a little nervous. I was brand new in the Lord. I've been on television a number of times since, but the fact is I was really scared. And I, it's true, I have a dimension of ADHD. As a therapist, I have ADHD. It's okay. Uh, my name is Fred Antonelli, and I have ADHD. None of the rest of you do, do you? Uh-uh. All drummers have ADHD. And, uh, and so my, my focus went here and there. And he said, uh, Fred, um, I understand that you, you, know, you were in a drug background and... and uh, you know, why don't you talk with us? You have a testimony or something. And so I was starting out with my testimony. Yeah, I was in the drug. And a cameraman whispered something behind the camera. I forget exactly what it was, but he said something behind the camera. And I was talking. I might have been into that conversation for 20 seconds. I thought it was doing pretty good. He said something. And when he said it, it diverted my attention. And on not national television, but local television all over the state of Maryland and even Pennsylvania, I went from talking like this to... (laughs) 
And it was just air silence. And Larry Angel's looking at me, and Tom's looking over. Hey, <laughs> Larry Angel, I just went, no, 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 no. And I'm looking at this thing, and I just went blank. My whole, everything went blank in me. And Larry Angel said, right, okay, we'll be right back with you. Tom, could we, and then he went and talked with Tom, and I'm sitting there with egg on my face. I'm telling you, I am, I look so stupid. I feel so stupid. He never came back to me. I would not have come back to me. And so we left, and my wife, of course, with all of her friends, because she said, hey, here's all my friends. And when I was going like this, she said, does anybody have any place to go? Why don't you go ahead and restroom and stuff? Just get out of there. Because my, my husband's having a moment here. I went home to our apartment. I'll never forget this. And I felt so stupid. I felt, I, I just gave my heart to the Lord. I did, and I, well, I had a, I was rather chemically challenged prior to that. And I thought, I don't have anything to offer. And then the words from my past, what were spoken to me as a child sometimes, you're never going to amount to anything. You can't do anything. You're not, you're not going to, you, 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 you're, you're not smart in terms of your academics. Things aren't going to work out for you. It all began to come to my forefront, and the enemy was telling me, see, I told you. Nothing's ever going to happen to you. Nothing, you're never going to succeed in anything. This is who you are. And I remember crying. Remember the Dakes Bible? Big Dakes Bible. You could have hit somebody and knocked them out with it. Great big Dakes Bible. And I remember laying that thing down. Her brother gave it to me. And I began to pray and I said, God, either these things are true or I am who you say I am. And God, you said that I am in you and you are in me. God, I, I look to you to define me because the enemy is trying to tell me that I'm never going to succeed in anything and I won't even be able to preach your word. And I, at that day, I remember, I'm either going to let him take over my life or I'm going to trust God. And it was just uh, maybe days after that that I got filled with the Holy Spirit. And when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, my whole life changed. Why am I telling you this? Because the enemy is not going to give up on you. If you think for one moment because you're a Christian and you proclaim his name and you go to a wonderful church and you're worshiping the Lord with great worship music, that somehow you're, you are um, um, insulated from everything that the enemy wants to put in your life and try to take away from you, you better think again. He's going to try to do everything he can to throw you off guard. But know this, greater is he that's within you than he that's in the world. And I'm telling you something else. When you get filled with the Holy Spirit, it has nothing to do with redemption. The blood of Christ has everything to do with redemption. But when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, your life, your dimension, your words, your mind, your very makeup will change because you can stand against the enemy and say, I will not let you do that to me or my family or what I'm trying to do for the kingdom of God. He'll try to do it. He'll try to knock you down. But I'm telling you, when you begin to pray in the Spirit, just stop and begin to worship and pray in the Spirit. It's nothing like it. Because it puts you into another dimension. You're out of yourself. No longer you're just thinking about you. You've just entered into the things of God. And you're just going, God, if you don't do it, it can't be done. Father, if you can use Balaam's donkey, you can use me. God, if you've used others, you can use me. There's nothing you couldn't do in me that you couldn't do in somebody else. And if you do that, you're going to find you're going to succeed in many, many things. Not talking about necessarily money and those things, but you're going to exceed. There's an, there is an attack against you, and you have to stand against it. So I want to talk with you for just a moment about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, I know some of you are filled with the Spirit. But again, we are on the precipice, I believe, of a great revival. And if you're going to be used in that fifth great awakening, you're going to have to be prepared, and you're going to have to be challenged and you're going to have to have all the armament you possibly can there is no better armament and power on the face of this entire globe or the universe than the power of the holy spirit of god almighty and you pray put that power in you my gosh there's nothing you're going to be able to it doesn't make any difference what he does he could kill you with making it he kills you and then a hundred raise up right after you and, you, and, and there's nothing, nothing that can be done other than the victory of Christ that leads people to Christ 
and brings people into a, a sense of power with him. So look at this. Acts in chapter 1 and verse 4 through 8. I think we have it there. At least I think I get it. Listen to this. Jesus instructed them, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait here until you've received the gift I told you about. The gift the Father has promised. And when the Father promises something, our Father, our Heavenly Father, He's going to make it good. He's not going to give you something to take it away from you. The promise, and I'm going to go into that in just a minute. But John baptized with water, and a few days from now, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And every time, it says, every time they were gathered together, they asked Him, Lord, is it now the time for you to free Israel and restore the kingdom? Because they were expecting him to just come and blow it up. You know, we want you just to, yeah, I know you're going to be baptized. You know, I can almost see it, Pastor. I'm going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Oh, that's wonderful. And when are you going to blow up it? When are you going to blow up all the bad guys? You're the Messiah. All right, when are you going to restore Jerusalem? Come on, God, let's do it. And uh, Jesus, with all of us, agape love, you know, just must have been going, <laughs> just, just relax here for a minute. You got, you're in the wrong direction here. I got something else for you. And he answered them, the father is the one who sets the fixed dates and the times of their fulfillment. You're not permitted to know the timing of all that he has prepared for you by his own authority. But I promise you, notice what he said, but I promise you this. I promise you this. Check out what he's saying. He's making this bold declaration. I promise you this. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be seized. You will be, you will be grabbed. You will be gripped with the power of God. It will literally take over your life. The power of God. You will be my messengers to Jerusalem, Judea, and remotest parts of the earth, even Pen Yen. I want to give you two more scriptures that are, I didn't give them because this, it's really in, it, it, it's cohesive with what's being said. John chapter 14, 15 and 17 through 17. He says, uh, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and, uh, and be with you forever. What is it? The spirit of truth. Forever. And anything you ever do, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor it knows him. The world does not know or see God right now because they're blinded to it and they don't care. They have not, this, they have not experienced the power of God. It's a whole other realm. They don't see it. But you do. And you have it. And you know it. And it's a mighty power. Mightier than anything you've ever experienced in your life. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. One last scripture here. Luke chapter 3, verse 16. John answered them and said, because what was happening is John was beginning to baptize. And he's, I'm, gonna be, I'm just going to take a little liberty here. Uh, and they were kind of, uh, quite a bit of liberty. And they're coming to John, his disciples, and they're going, John, do you know that this ministry that you've had, this big ministry, you got the radio, you got the television, you got the books, you got everything going, man. You're just, a, everything's about you and the baptism thing. I mean, all of Jerusalem is listening to you. It's been awesome. But now we understand that Jesus got this thing over here and he's baptizing too. It's kind of diminishing, you know, your ministry. This is a lot of liberty. He's doing his thing and it's diminishing your name. John was the one who said, he must increase and I must decrease, right? Because he that comes from above is above all. And John answered and said, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come the straps of his sandals. I'm not even worthy to untie. And he is going to baptize you. He is going to immerse you. You're going to be like a sponge and swell up with everything that he has because he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. I'm going to say that again because it just felt good, okay? <laughs> going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And the word literally means lightning. 
Now, I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I'm telling you, that's a lot of power there. And that power that he's talking about is what he wants to give you. Live in you, dwell in you, saturate every atom on your entire body. You are a powerful person in Christ. The enemy fears what is in you. That's the reason he tries to stumble you as much as he does. But you look him in the face and you say, you know, take your best shot. Because the Lord God Almighty stands before me and behind me and to my left and to my right. So if you're going to come after me, you're going to have to go through him. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus has this laser focus on his disciples. The second most important aspect of our salvation. Of course, Christ, the blood of Christ, promises us eternity with him. He's cleansed us from our sins. But then there is this need, and he's putting great emphasis on it, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to say this now, too, if I could. And I know there's a number of people who are filled with the Holy Spirit here, but there's people who are, are not filled with the Holy Spirit either. When you're, some, somehow we think when we're prayed over that something has to hit us in the head, shake us, put all the marbles in the front of our head, that somehow God will do something in us. He'll move my lips, he'll move my tongue, and unless he does, I'm just going to sit there and just wait. That is a step of faith, the same as when you gave your heart to Christ, by faith. And when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, all you need to do is just, what I tell people is lift your hands and just say, Jesus, Jesus. And as you're praying his name, all of a sudden you begin to speak in this language. You, just, doesn't, you don't have to sound like anybody else. You don't have to sound the syllables that they have. You don't have to do any of that. You just need to, by faith, let it roll off your lips. And when you do that, you will feel the electricity and the glory of God. Because it will fill you from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet. So if you want it, it's yours. Don't struggle over it. You don't, have to, you don't have to agonize over it. That's not what God's saying. You just receive it. And you believe it. And you move in it. And when you do, your life is revolutionized. So we, we, um, this whole aspect of God's Holy Spirit, this dunamos, you got a great teacher and your pastor, so you know what that means. Dunamos is a, the dynamite where we get the word dynamite, this power source provided. Jesus um, was centering on this, and he was trying to get them to see that this gift of the Holy Spirit is immensely powerful because it helps your walk, it helps your faith, it helps you in the most difficult times of your life. It helps you when you find, I don't have what it takes, my marriage is falling apart, I have a mental health issue, I have been injured, the words from my past haunt me in my present, I feel like I'm not able to go on because every time I try, I tend to fail. I'm not sure that I'm worth anything or I'm not sure that tomorrow is going to bring me what it is that I need. That's the enemy trying to destroy you, hamper you, and define you. So you have to determine whether you're going to fight him. Now, when you fight in a war, you don't go into war with a BB gun. You don't fight your enemy with the BB gun. If it's, a, it's a bad enemy. You don't go into Beirut and all those places with a little slingshot. Even though there was a David and Goliath. I know you can preach that to me, but hold on. The fact is, you go in, you want to be armed up. You want to make sure that you're not only armed up, but you are going to win. That's the whole purpose. A fighter doesn't go into a ring saying, I know I'm going to a fight, but you know, I know I'm going to lose, so just be easy on me, if you would, please. A fighter goes into to win. Paul talks about that. Boxing. You want to go in and you want to win. The way you win is to realize the source of power that you have access to. That source of power is what Jesus is talking about in the baptism in the Holy Spirit and fire. It isn't natural. It is supernatural. That meets a natural human being. 
And when the supernatural meets the natural by faith, there is nothing you can't do for God and nothing you can't stand up against. We all have a human condition. We all fall short. God understood that. That's the reason for the cross. And when he gives us the power, we have the same power that the Old Testament had, those guys who moved in great, great, mighty power. We have the same Holy Spirit that the apostles had and the disciples of old had. The same one. It's nothing new. Hey, Paul was a great man of God. Paul was a great pro. Hey, Paul was a great apostle. Paul did this. Peter did this. Luke did all these great guys. And they were great men. All of these great men and women, they were fantastic. But they don't have nothing that you can't have. He, the Holy Spirit hasn't changed. It, the same Holy Spirit that, that visits you is the exact same Holy Spirit that visits these men and these women. Nothing different. Same one. And so Jesus then gets 72 people. He gets 72 people, his, his, his disciples, and he said, uh, go out and I want you to... Uh, uh, preach the kingdom of God and that the kingdom of God is near and heal the sick. But he had a caveat with that. The caveat of the warning was, you got to watch it because I don't want it to be about you. These guys go out and they come back kind of all puffed up. I can see them kind of all puffed up. They said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. I imagine it was a rush. You sit there and there's demons all over the place. It's almost like walking into Washington, D.C. in the Capitol. There's demons all over. I'm sorry. I said I wouldn't get it. At any rate, and they said, even the demons are subject to us. You should have been there, Lord. It was awesome. In your name, we cast these devils out. Not just like you did, Lord. It was tremendous. And Jesus filled with love, and, but yet trying to treat them nicely without, you know, really ripping them up. He said, look, 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 guys. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. What do you think this is? You got a couple demons? I saw them when we kicked him out. I've given you authority to trample over the snakes. I've given you authority to trample over the scorpions and to overcome all of the power of the enemy. Nothing's going to harm you. However, don't rejoice that the spirits are submitted to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven because... That's what I want you to do. Those forces are going to try to hinder you from preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and sharing with them the love of God. And everything in hell is going to try to come against you, even in your own life, even in your marital life or your single life. It doesn't make any sense. Everything the enemy is going to try to do to try to get you to hamper that. And so Jesus kind of gave them a taste of, of what he was trying to express to them. And when we look at all of these these snakes and scorpions, I, you can, you can, it's, it's a depiction of a multiple array of different things. And I see them with the things that we struggle with. And I, I say this uh, in a way that, uh, uh, because it's real. As a mental health professional, I've counseled thousands of people. And there's some pretty um, painful stories. A lot of painful stories. Uh, we all go through some stuff, don't we? And we know how to deal with it because I say, how you doing, brother? Hey, I'm doing pretty good, man. How about yourself? Praise God, isn't he good? Yeah, he's good, man. Hey, you really doing okay? Yeah, I'm doing fine, man. And then they go home and they drive and they go, God, I feel so horrible about myself. I, I, I don't know, God. It's just, I, I, I hide like this. I really need, we're not flies on the wall. We don't see what's going on in people's lives. We all have issues. But I'm telling you, and it's been the case in my life and many, many other people's lives. When you rely on God, when you look to him, when you believe that he can do in your life what you cannot do in your own life, when you stop, and I've said this to a couple people today, and I'm going to share it with you. When I was in the Air Force, I was in... Um, I was an air, air policeman, and so we were, I was in K-9. I hated it. I didn't like, I, we had a dog growing up, a shepherd, but I didn't, I didn't want to be there. I, did, I went in the Air Force to do nothing. That was what I actually went in the Air Force for. How many Air Force people do we have here? 
former Air Force people. Anybody else? This is true confession time then. Okay. The people going in the Army, they work a lot and they get killed and stuff. Marines, never, never, never. So, so I went in 1970 during the Vietnam War, and I thought, well, I'm going to go in the Air Force because they don't do nothing. At least that's what I'm told they do. And so I went in, and the next thing I know, I get out of basic training, and I was going to be in... I didn't know the Lord, so, okay, so uh, I thought I would be local and doing some domestic policing in the Air Force and then, you know, confiscate stuff and maybe use it myself and sell it. And that. I, was, I needed saving, okay? I really needed saving. And, uh, but uh, I'll never forget it. Uh, they needed 62 uh, airmen to, to go into canine. Stop. Not me. I don't want no dog because I know where those people go. They go where the other place. They go to that Vietnam. I am not going there. Remember, I came in here to do nothing. And I'm going to try my best to accomplish my goal. I'll never forget, there were three people that volunteered because he asked for volunteers. And then they went to alphabetical order. I so hoped that my name was Zanatelli that day <laughs> instead of Antonelli. And they picked me, and I was messed up. And I was for sure that I wasn't going to make it. That's how I came to the Lord, because I called this girl up over here. It was my girlfriend at the time. I said, this is what's happening. We're all in trouble. They're going to take me over there. I'm probably going to get killed. I was, I was already planning my death, and it was terrible. You know, I'm going, to, I'm going to get killed. This is, well, she's, well, you haven't even gone yet. I know, but I'm probably going to get killed anyway. It's just a bad day. This is a bad day. And they gave me a dog, and it's big, and it growls. It doesn't like me, and I don't like him. It's a bad way to start out. <clears throat> but I remember they, they told me that, you know, they train you. And so they got this dog, and they said, you know, the guy comes out with the pads, you know, attack, attack, attack. You know, the dog's attack. And then it comes a time that says heal. So they have to stop. And they didn't stop. The guy came up with the pads and the attack. So they used to give us these little cattle prods, little ones. And so you say, heel. The dog go like this. And just about two times, and he realized when he heard that heel, it's going to come next. So he just kind of stopped. And so um, they talked, uh, and some of those airmen would run. I'll never forget what this guy said. Uh, he said, uh, the D.I. said, look, when a dog comes at you, What's the first thing you do? What's the first thing you do if a dog comes to you? Uh, go ahead, say it. Run, right? That's normal. That's natural. That's smart, you would think. But the animal knows he has you on the run. And while you're running, he knows, now, I got you. He's going to start trying to bite you and, and get, your, get, get you out of here, but he's going to try to bite you as much as he can until he does. So he, you're running, and he's biting it's not a way to be. And they said, what you need to do is you need to, even though the dog, you don't run, and the dog's ground lights, you turn around and you stand right in front of him. And you just wait and you put your hands down like this. And all of a sudden, the dog has a different perspective of you. You're not running, and he's realizing you're bigger than he is. Whether you're male or female. You're, he may bark, he may yell, but he's stopping. And when he stops, then you can do your maneuvers and work backwards. Or you can stop and move forward. And he's, the dog is very cautious at this point because now he doesn't know what you're going to do to him. Why am I saying this? That's exactly what the enemy tries to do to us every day. We run from him with the things that bother us. We run from him with the areas of our lives that we feel somehow are, have gotten the best of us. And, and we find ourselves in a place where we're running and getting nipped all day and there's no forward progress with us. We just find ourselves in a, in a bigger hole. Instead of saying to the enemy, wait a minute, I am not going to have you nip my heels anymore. Christ died on the cross and he gave me the Holy Spirit. Now, man, I'm going to face you or die, but I face you. I'm facing you in the name of Jesus. David said, you come to, uh, with Goliath, you come to me with a, he didn't make no sense. David was just a little boy, a teenager probably at the time. This was a big, big monster. It made no sense. God often makes no sense. Takes 32,000 men with Gideon and leaves him with 300. That's senseless. Can somebody agree with me? Yeah. Yet, it's so God. I'm going to do something with this dead man. But he's dead. <laughs> Raises him from the dead. And so you stop and you realize, 
I'm not, I'm not going to run anymore. I'm going to stand there for her. I'm going to face you. And I'm going to move in the power that God's given me. And there's two scriptures here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this, and then we're going to stop, and we're going to pray. I'm going to give you a power tool. How many of you like power tools? Now, if you're a man, raise your hand and you go, I dig a power tool, man. I really do. Come on. It's, it's, it's okay. You can do that. You're going to heaven. It doesn't make any difference. You can, how, many, how, many, how many men and I, men do we have here today? Anybody? Got a, you like a power tool now, brother. Don't tell me you know. God's given all you guys the gifts. You make us look silly. I'm going to give you a power tool to stand up against the enemy. And this is it. Two scriptures. First was in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15. Listen to me, because you're going to think I'm crazy if you haven't already, okay? But listen to what I'm saying. I'm going to give you the greatest power tool to stand against the enemy so that when he's running after you, you can turn around, face him right in the face like David. You come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. Everything that can take me down in a second's time. And this is senseless that I'm even before you. However, I come to you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. And this day I'm going to lop off your head and the birds are going to be eating out of it. Can you imagine where Goliath is just looking at him going, you are so stupid little kid. Today I'm going to kill you so quick and I'm going to know you're born. And we all know the rest of the story. It doesn't make sense, but neither does God, because two and two often doesn't equal four with God. You can't put him in a box. Here's my power tool for you. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15. So, what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing in the spirit. And I will also sing with my understanding. So if I'm praying in the Spirit, what does that mean? Personally, I think you got to be, you can pray in any, you can pray, we can always pray. God's going to hear our prayers. But praying in the Spirit is praying with power, praying with dunamos, praying with this stuff that Jesus is talking about. And you pray in the Spirit, Lord, I'm asking you right now to take the devil out. This guy's trying to mess with me, Lord, but Lord, I give it to you. I'm praying and I'm believing and I'm looking, Lord, and I'm trying to trust every inch of my life, and I know you're going to see me through, and I'm praying, and I'm believing, and I'm praying, I'm trusting, and let the enemy get a good soaking of that, because he can't enter that area when you're praying like that. He cannot enter that area. He dare not enter that area, because you're praying to the living God. And then it says, I will also sing in the spirits. What does that mean? <laughs> I don't know. You mean like a song? Like singing what? In the spirit? I know how to sing a worship song. How do you sing in the spirit? How many have ever sang in the spirit? How many have ever sang in the spirit speaking in tongues? Okay, we got some here. We got a few here. And there's others just going, oh, my Lord, he's going to end up praying for me with this thing. Oh, God, I don't want to be, I don't want anybody to know. We're talking power tools here. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. And pray in the spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. And I can imagine you can give him all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying with all people. Here's what I'm saying in closing. You remember Costa Dare, right? This, this guy is known in Elam. He's dead. He's going to be with the Lord. He prayed in the spirit. He talked like this, and he got a, one of those mustaches that curled like this. Just like this, and he twitched that thing. He was a man of God. He was from Israel. He was a great, pal and, and the Palestine, Palestinian area as well. He keep back and forth. And this guy was a man of God. He was a small guy. He was powerful. My wife knew him. Powerful man of God. They called him the apostle of joy. And he was the kind of guy, he'd walk up to him and say, hey, praise the Lord. Come here to me. Come here to me. 
And he brought Jaria close and he close and he kissed you on the left cheek. Then he kissed you on the right cheek. He's the only guy who can kiss you and get away with it. He kissed you on the left, he kissed you on the right. He said, and, and he kissed you on the left in the name of the Father. Kiss you on the right. Oh, that's Father, Son. And I kiss you in the Holy Ghost. He said, kiss you like three times. But this is what I learned from him. The dog chased him, right? He said, don't ever run from the devil. You just stand and you realize, what's your strength, the Bible says? The something of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Stand up if you would. The power tool is this. Hallelujah. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to pray in the Spirit here, Pastor, with your permission. I'm going to pray in the Spirit. And, those who, and when you pray in the Spirit, if you speak in tongues, I want you to do that. And I'm, I am trusting God, Lord Jesus, that He's going to minister to you in such a way that you're going to begin to actually feel the strength from heaven. A brother was talking about angels here. We talked about angels earlier. I believe they're around, you see. And, and when you pray in the Spirit and you realize the joy of the Lord is your strength, I've done this before. Here's what you're going to think. I might be crazy. I've gone down the highway at times during some very, very difficult times. And we've gone through difficult times with some family situations. So much so that it would just, it was just wrenching. And there were times I would be riding down in the car and I could do nothing. I felt lower than a lizard's lung. You almost had to scrape me up with a spatula. And I remember what Costa said. I said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. <laughs> Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, God, thank you, thank you, Lord. I'm rejoicing in you, and I'm thanking you by faith, God, that you're going to meet me and get the devil off my back. Oh, <laughs> oh God, I want to glorify your name. And you get happy like that. You might think, well, you can't get that way when you're depressed. Oh, yes, you can. Because you have the power of the Holy Spirit, it's time we tap in to this great and mighty power that God has given us. So I'm going to worship. In the, I don't know where the worship team is. The worship team can come up, brother. Come on up. Do a little acoustic something here. We're just going to, we're going to, we're going to as, uh, as the worship team plays, they're just going to do some instrumental here. As they play, I want you to begin to lift your hands in just a moment. And we're going to rejoice in the Lord. But when, I, when you rejoice in the Lord, you got to let your face know it, all right? Some of you got some really nice smiles. God gave them to you. And so I want you to rejoice in the Lord in just a second. And I want to hear this. <laughs> oh, God, the joy of the Lord is my strength. He, Lord, I rejoice in you. Oh, God, I know that you are the God over the universe, and you are the God over me, and you are the God over my family, and you're the God over my finances, and you're the God over my health, and you're the God over every aspect of my life. And God, I rejoice, I rejoice, I rejoice, and I lift my hands as an act of surrender, and I thank God because I'm laughing because God Almighty, it's my strength, and I'm laughing because the enemy is doing everything he can to try to get me to frown and be depressed, but I will not do it. I will connect with you, Lord, and I will allow you to bring heaven down on me and lift me up from this place that the enemy is trying to keep me. So as they pray, as they sing, let's begin to worship and sing in the Spirit, okay? Let's just do that. Oh, Ne <laughs> <laughs> 